So first, everybody, thanks for joining us. And uh, just I'll do a real quick intro. I don't even know where I met John. Honestly, do you know where I met you? Um, no, uh, I, it was a while ago, so I don't remember. Mutual friends or whatever. Um, and I flew out to Colorado with those guys, where John and uh, Craig Weller, who's also in this caller at, and uh, the rest is history. So when it comes to special ops and stress resilience and the whole big picture of, of managing stress effectively, there, there really aren't better guys than John and Craig. And they put together this, uh, this new book here, which I'll show you guys. We can, I'm sure John will talk about at some point. And this is, this is literally, this should be a certification course textbook. I mean, it's, it's incredibly in depth and uh, the range of material it covers is, is pretty mind boggling. And they just put this out there and they've been working on it for years and years. So I want them to just kind of are trying to jump on and cover some of what's in the book and give you some tips about how to improve resilience because now more than ever, I would say it's a hugely important skill to be able to have. I mean, when, when have we been more stressed than history than at least recent history than right now? I mean, it's, it's a crazy time we're living in. So um, one thing, before we get started, I thought it was fascinating just uh, reading through the book. You talked a bit about your background in terms of like the, you know, the always broken guy. And I've always found that coaches that are really successful often are that because they've had a problem for themselves. They tried to solve and in that process of figuring out how to solve it for themselves, they figure out how to solve it for other people. So uh, maybe real quick, just give you a background about yourself and how you came to develop a lot of the stuff you did and maybe a little bit uh, Craig's background driving swick boats and, and all that stuff and then you know go from there cool yeah so I'll do a short intro um, thanks Joel for the uh, introduction and then I'll start on the presentation and as Joel said I'm going to talk about resilience today so as Joel said I had a ton of injuries growing up um, I get six surgeries by the time I was 22 uh, so it was like a terrible college athlete you know <laughs> um, constantly injured and then getting it uh, having surgeries and that led me, but I was also the guy who worked harder than anybody. Um, so I do everything that the physical therapist and the strength coach and everybody told me to do. Um, and it didn't really lead to any kind of positive outcome. So, uh, I kind of, I became obsessed with performance and resilience and health and just trying to figure out why I was so beat up. Um, so during college I studied uh, pre-med and I worked with you know, orthopedic surgeons, PTs. And then eventually my senior year, I met a guy who had been a strength coach for a couple of years and then was doing his PhD in biomechanics. And then I started helping him do his dissertation research. And he had this really broad knowledge where he understood physiology, biomechanics, physical therapy, strength conditioning. He had a little bit of a background in psychology. So he had this really broad base to pull from and he wasn't a specialist in any one particular area. And so he could work with people who were a lot more challenging and figure out their limiting factors um, and had far more success than any of these other individuals who these career paths I was looking down. And so it really piqued my interest. And I learned a lot from him as I helped him do his dissertation. And then when I moved in you know, to the real world after I graduated, um, I met Craig Weller, who I had been following for a little bit. And his background was he had been in the Navy as a SWIC, which is a... Uh, special operations boat guy for uh, SEAL teams. Um, and his background was similar in that he obviously had gone on a completely different path, but he had faced a lot of obstacles and had figured out how to navigate those. Like he joined the Navy um, trying to go into a special operations program without really knowing how to swim um, and still somehow yeah. managed to yeah. pass selection. Yeah, after, I don't know how he pulled that off. I mean, yeah, after two years of yeah. just like bumbling and learning and doing everything he could to make it to that uh, situation. So I knew we had like a common underlying philosophy. So I met up with Craig. Um, yeah, and we just hit it off and we started working together because we had a common philosophy, even though we had like very different backgrounds, those kind of converging areas of knowledge and a similar way of looking at the world led us to starting to work together and over the past decade, that's where we're at now. So I'll go ahead and start my presentation and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay. Nope. Mm, maybe. Screen share somewhere in there. Okay, got it. All right, can everybody see that? Yep. Okay. So 
uh, as I said, we worked together for the past decade. And, and during that time, uh, we started working to help prepare guys for these special operations selections courses, like the one that Craig went through. And the average fail rate during these programs tends to be 50 to 90%, depending on the program, time of year, some different luck, timing like that. Um, and over the past decade, Craig and I have been able to maintain a success rate of over 90% of the guys that we train who go through these selection processes end up succeeding. And just out just of curiosity, just personally, what's, what's the, what, what selection is the highest failure rate of the military branches? And the, uh, uh, I think pararescue, so PJs, because um, their demands are similar to physically to like Navy SEAL selection courses, but they also have a lot higher cognitive load because they're based, they're going to paramedic school simultaneously. Mm. Um, it's definitely probably the most difficult. They have to be able to do, because they attach to any um, special operations group and they have to be able to do that job. Yeah, I went down the Air Force group uh, not too long ago and they were talking about the, the PJs and the combat controllers. I mean, to be able to do the stuff and the stuff they do. I mean, people don't hear about that group nearly as much as the SEALs, obviously, but it's, mm -hmm. it's crazy what they're able to do. Yeah. Yeah, so it's been really interesting. So, you know, over the last decade, that's really what we dedicated ourselves to is figuring out this really strange and it's pretty small world of special operations. Um, and that's what we just wrote a book on, as Joel alluded to, and I'll talk to more about that later. Uh, but more importantly, even though it's this really narrow niche world, uh, it's just a really extreme version of the things, the qualities that we want most people to have. Uh, no matter who they are and what they're specifically training for. And as I'm going to talk about today, resilience, it's something that everybody can benefit from, no matter who you are. Um, you know, we actually own, I own a facility in Denver, Craig and I do. He has a couple of facilities in South Dakota. Um, and most of our clients there are gen pop clients and, you know, high school, college athletes. And these same principles, while they're not the only things that are not quite as at the top of our mind every single day, because this is the most and one of the most important things for special operations, they're still guiding principles and they're very important and they influence a lot of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so a couple things before I get started, um, just write down your questions. Uh, we'll have some time at the end for some Q and A. Um, as you'll see in the slides, I don't really have any information on them and that's for a good reason. I want you to pay attention to what I'm saying. And don't worry about taking notes. I have extensive notes for each slide. And when Joel sends out the recording of this, he can share the speaker notes and that'll be all the notes that you need. Um, and if you're trying to take notes, you'll probably miss a bunch of important details along the way. So as Joel said, I'm going to talk about resilience today. The first thing I want to do is define what that means. And resilience is an active process of adapting to and learning from challenging situations. In other words, it's the outcome of having a collection of abilities and skills. And all of those abilities and skills are trainable. And that's the most important part is that you can create these skills over time to become a much more resilient human being. Um, and resilience is really important because the more resilient you are, the more efficient you are. And the more efficient you are, the faster that you learn, the quicker that you recover, difficult situations cost you less psychologically and therefore physiologically. When they cost you less, that means you have more energy to adapt to physical and skill training. Uh, and what that really means is that your clients get far better results regardless of who they are over time. So next I wanna talk about stress. Um, and you know, I Joel sent out the article and we posted it and hopefully most of you guys have read that, but if not, I'm gonna recap it. Um, it's really important because stress is the primary, primary factor that you're gonna to need to manage in order to develop resilience. And in general, stress isn't a bad thing. Stress is what actually allows you to adapt to training um, and become more capable over time, and it's what allows you to perform. However, you need to manage that stress response. And it's important to note that stress is an opinion or your response to a situation. And that response can be modified through training over time. So as you can see on the continuum I have here, there's different types of stress responses. And the first thing that I want to talk about is the challenge base, or we call this a eustress stress response. And this is where you want to live most of the time. Um, this is what's going to allow you, um, this type of stress response is what's going to allow you to recover very quickly, to respond effectively, and most importantly, it allows you to maintain access to the executive parts of your brain that allow you to learn and modify your approach on the go. 
Whereas if you continue moving across the spectrum and you have more of a threat-based stress response, you tend to have a much more massive cascade of hormones that are released. And therefore it takes a lot longer to recover from that stress response, even if the corresponding activity is any, any more difficult. So in other words, if you're facing the same situation and you have a threat-based stress response, it'll just take a lot longer to recover from even if the physical energy expended is exactly the same because of this cascade of hormones it takes a long time for your body to clear. And most importantly, you lose access, you start losing access to the parts of your brain that allow you to think and modify your approach. In other words, you lose the ability to learn. And this is really important because if we're training people and we're, whether you're a sport coach or you're a strength and conditioning coach, your goal over time should be to teach people and create, you know, uh, skills in order to perform at higher and higher levels of difficulty, whether that's via intensity, duration, complexity, or some combination of those things. That's really what you're looking for. And that's also going to help you develop more physical skills. And as I said before, the stress response is variable and based on your opinion or your interpretation of your ability to deal with it. And there's two main things that drive that your sense of predictability of what is about to happen and your sense of control over your ability, um, ability to influence the outcome of what about what is about to happen. Um, and the way through this happens is during your anxiety or your orienting response. So anxiety is something that everybody's familiar with. Um, and it's not a bad thing when it precedes something actually difficult. And then your anxiety response uh, is appropriate and allows you to have this challenge based stress response. So imagine you're preparing for a workout, you're going to have this anxiety response where you start thinking about what is in front of you. And that starts to lead to this stress response. And if you feel a high sense of predictability and control because it's your opinion that you know what's about to happen, you know you can deal with that effectively, and you're gonna have a great workout, then you'll have this challenge-based work, this challenge-based stress response. And that's very effective. Where anxiety can go downhill is when you're thinking about something and then no stress response comes after that. And that's what people ha happens to people all the time. Another form of anxiety that people um, struggle with a lot is also rumination. And that's thinking about something that's already happened. And again, when either of these things happens absent of an actual physical challenge, um, then stress starts to accumulate. So that's what I want to talk about next. So stress is both cumulative and progressive. So what I mean by that is that you have a stress response and you start to recover from it. But if you have any kind of normal training session, you're going to have multiple stressors back to back to back. And so over the course of that training session, it's going to accumulate. And that's not too much of a problem as long as you're staying in that challenge-based stress response. Uh, you'll generally be able to recover and stay in that zone where you can think effectively, modify your approach, and can continue to get better. Um, whereas if you go into more of that threat-based response, again, you'll shut down. Um, the workout costs a lot more than it should, and you have a hard time recovering from that workout. And like, as I said, stress is cumulative and progressive. So as you accumulate stress over time, so you're having multiple stressors back to back to back to back, um, then you progressively lose that ability to modify your approach on the go. And again, this shuts down learning. Uh, and so over time, what we wanna do is manage our stress more effectively. And when you stay in that challenge zone or that you stress zone of stress, it takes a long time for stress to accumulate. You recover much faster from that. Um, and you learn a lot faster. And again, this leads to a really effective adaptation over time. And psychology plays a large role in this process. So psychology is a really deep subject, and we talk about it extensively in the book. Um, I don't have time to cover all the concepts of a resilient mind and how psychology plays a role in that. But um, some general thing concepts of a resilient mind are that challenge isn't a bad thing. Um, someone who is resilient is always looking to learn. They see mistakes and op as opportunities to improve. They always feel a sense uh, of control over their actions and outcomes. They don't live in the past or the future. They tend to focus more on the task at hand. Uh, they see feedback as an opportunity to learn, not something that to be avoided. Um, they don't always uh, feel the need to look good. They can invest in short-term loss for long-term gain. And what I mean by that are these are clients who say their technique isn't going well on a particular movement, so you're doing a squat with them. They're okay reducing the load in order to dial in the technique more effectively so that they can do the 
exercise properly and therefore in the long run become much more stronger and get have better outcomes. Um, and I know we'd all love to have this client who has this perfect mindset and approaches everything this way. Um, and the good news is that is it's all these things are trainable. Um, it takes a long time, but the only way through which it's trainable is to first manage the stress response and utilize a lot of the mental skills I'm going to talk about here in just a second in order to do that effectively. And when you do that, it'll allow you to start training some of these specific mindsets and beliefs and tendencies that will then help keep this, start this positive feedback loop that makes you more and more and more resilient over time. So again, it's covered in depth in the book. Um, I just don't have time to cover it all today. So again, as I said, I want to focus on practical application, which brings me to pain and fatigue. So pain and fatigue obviously coexist with all physical training. And if they're not managed effectively, they can both create a lot of perceived stress. Um, and the important thing to know that you need to know, and then you need to be able to communicate to your clients, is that neither pain or fatigue indicate actual physical damage. Now they can, but more often than not, they don't. Uh, your body is really intelligent, your brain is. And so it uses the sensory information when we feel pain or we feel fatigue as a way to help protect and shut things down before that actual physical damage happens. But what that means is that that sensory information that is coming into our brain that leads to this sensation of pain and fatigue are largely lying to us. And they're occurring before anything bad is actually happening to our body. And so based on how we interact with that sensory information and whether or not we attune to that thing or we have skills to um, not necessarily ignore, but set it aside, we can turn the volume up or turn the volume down um, on those sensations, which then can greatly influence the amount of perceived stress that somebody feels during a difficult training uh, you know, session. So again, as, as I said, the first step is education of what pain and fatigue really are. Because most clients, from my experience, think that if they feel pain in a particular area or they're starting to feel fatigue, it's an indicator of something bad occurring within their body and that it's very real and that they have no control, most importantly, over that sensation and that they're just at the hands of that sensory information coming into their brain. And that's not true. Uh, and by teaching somebody and giving them that mental model that by using their attention skillfully and changing what they're focusing on, you can control their experience of pain and fatigue. So that's what I'm gonna talk about next. So attention is really the primary medium through which you help change the way people think about uh, everything that is going on in their, their mind. And there's three primary forms of attention I wanna talk about. So the first one is metacognition and metamotion. That's basically what we've been doing so far. We've been talking or thinking about thinking and thinking about emotions. And that's what has to happen before you're able to modify somebody's internal thought process on the go. Because you have to get them to understand that there's a different way to think about something that might be more effective for them. So again, that's the first step. Um, another aspect of attention that is very helpful is self-awareness. And this is really just looking in retrospect and analyzing tendencies. And this is what you're gonna use um, both during training sessions and after them. And you're gonna ask questions to have clients use their attention to reflect on what they were telling themselves, their internal dialogue, and their experience. And then they're gonna learn from that and be able to interrupt and change those feedback loops, which I'll talk about here in a second. And mindfulness, this is the one you're gonna use the most often. And mindfulness is really just meaning focusing on the present moment and the internal dialogue or the internal narrative that is going on in your brain and your stream of consciousness. And anybody who has meditated uh, realizes how difficult this really is. Um, that you have all these like cascades of thoughts and feelings and sensations coming in and out of your brain all the time. Um, and it's really hard to control that. However, the more you do it and just start paying attention to what your brain is telling you and what's happening, the more skillful you get at using your attention and directing it, whether or not you're trying to attune to something in the present or thinking about something in the past, or you're just thinking about thinking or some bigger picture thing. And it's not about being perfect. It's just about raising awareness and using these, this skill over time. So let's talk about some specific mental skills 
that you can use to help manage stress more effectively. So as I said, I'm gonna talk about mental skills and this is really where the rubber meets the road. These are gonna be the specific things that you're gonna to use to help you manage pain and fatigue and ultimately the entire stress response to stay in that sweet spot so that you become more capable over time. I'm gonna cover four different things or five different things actually. Um, these are the most commonly ones, commonly used ones. Um, however, they're not, this isn't an exhaustive list. We list quite a few more in the book. Uh, but this is a good place to start, and these will help considerably um, in actual training sessions. If you could use these tomorrow um, with yourself and with your clients, and it, could, it will have a large impact on their ability to manage uh, themselves effectively and stay in that sweet spot with a stress response. So the first thing that I'm going to talk about is self-talk. So self-talk... Um, so under fatigue, you can really only hold one thought in your narrative at a time. So learning to recognize that narrative or the story that you're telling yourself um, is really effective. And simply by even paying attention to your internal narrative, you shift your attention away from things like your sensation of pain, your sensation of fatigue, um, or any other sensations that you happen to be feeling during that time. And by doing so, you're turning the volume down on those things. Uh, and a lot of times your self-talk will either uh, enhance or significantly reduce your ability to manage stress. As we talked about in the stress response, your sense of, or your perception or your opinion of your sense of predictability and control over the situation is what may, you know, changes your overarching stress response. So by starting to attune to what your internal dialogue or what your self-talk is, you can start to realize whether or not your internal dialogue is reducing your sense of predictability and control or enhancing that. Um, and again, simply by even paying attention to it, it helps keep you present um, and it'll, it allows you to interrupt that feedback loop and change it over time. So as a coach, there's a few questions that you can use. So in the moment, uh, a good question to use is to ask, what are you telling yourself? And again, simply by doing this, the client will have to pay attention to that and not to something else that they might be fixating on. Um, if you are preparing for something challenging and somebody seems distracted, maybe too stressed out or anything like that, this is the opportunity to ask yourself, what do you believe is about to happen? And again, this will give you a really good insight into that person's self-talk or internal narrative. It also gives you a good insight into the degree of control or predictability that they feel. And that gives you the opportunity to interrupt that feedback loop and find one that's more effective for them. And then the last one is, is why did you just do that? And that's something that you can do in retrospect. So especially if you see somebody who gives up during the middle of a set, uh, doesn't put the best effort forth, but you know they really care about improving, that's a good question. And again, the common root of all of these is they're open-ended and it's important you ask these in a really inquisitive nature, not in a, a judgmental way where you're trying to uh, you know, make evaluation of whether or not their internal dialogue is helpful or not. It's more about just exploring that thing, starting to pay attention to it, and by doing so, that opens up the door to change that over time. And it's important to note that self-talk doesn't even have to be positive. It can be completely neutral. So, for example, an SAS guy that we talked to recently used Taylor Swift songs in his head during shitty days in selection. Um, so he would just have those Taylor Swift lyrics because they're super catchy, and he would just repeat it over and over and over again. And what it did is it just helped him not fixate on how much longer he had to go, how bad he was feeling, how tired he was, or anything else. So that brings me to the next mental skill I want to talk about, which is self-hurting. And self-hurting is this idea that our choices don't just reveal our presence, our uh, don't just re reveal our preferences, but they shape them. And so what I mean by that is that when you change a feedback loop and you change your internal narrative, over time you become more and more likely to use that same narrative over and over and over again in those similar situations. And that's the great thing about this, is that these skills, while they can be used, should be used fairly consistently, it's not like you have to reuse them every single time you go out. As soon as you start implementing them in training sessions, that will start to become the default mechanism through which you get through challenging situations. And then you're more likely, the more times you do that, to use those strategies in those stressful situations, which means you're become more and more skillful at managing stress. 
And that's the concept of self-hurting. So segmenting is the next thing I want to talk about. And that's just breaking a challenging situation down into bite-sized chunks. And I think anybody who has done any length of endurance training has most likely figured this out. Um, so segmenting is really simple. Uh, you know, when people again, do endurance work, a lot of times what they do, say they're running a long distance, uh, they'll break that down to something they can manage. And they'll tell themselves, I just have to make it one more mile, or I just have to make it to the top of this hill, or I just have to make it one more time around the track. Um, and this is a really powerful strategy uh, because it, allow, it shifts you to focusing on what's something that you can control, that you have a high sense of predictability and control over. You're reducing the unknowns, which reduces the amount of anxiety you're gonna feel about something in the future because you have no idea where you're gonna be at you know, an hour from now or whatever it is in a workout. And this is going to be um, very, a very individual thing. Some people become overwhelmed by a 30 minute workout. Some people, it takes quite a bit for them to need to use segmenting before they're going to start, uh, you know, shifting out of that sense of predictability and control and start to feel overwhelmed. Um, as I said, this is really powerful because it helps you stay present. And it's not also limited to the domain of training. This can be really effective for anything. So for example, we use a lot of, um, a lot of our clients use this in their selection process. Because the thing about a military special operations selection program is that no particular event or particular day is that overwhelmingly bad. It's just that it never ends. It's one event after another, after another, day after day after day, week after week after week. And so unless you're able to break that down into something you can manage, it doesn't matter how fit you are, or how mentally tough or whatever other mental you know, term you want to use about somebody who has high mental capability, um, you're going to become overwhelmed because it's just this massive thing to try to wrap your mind around. And so the only thing you can really focus on is a small chunk of the thing that's in front of you. And you just keep moving that milepost over and over and over again. So in the military, uh, it's known as breaking the day into chow to chow or meal to meal times. Um, but again, individuals can use this in their work life. They can use this uh, during training sessions. Again, it's a really effective method of maintaining a sense of control and predictability. And so as a coach, some good questions to ask. Again, we want to go back to open-ended questions. You know, what is a manageable, manageable amount of time or distance that you can wrap your head around? Um, another good one, phrase that, again, you can kind of translate to the self-talk is when the hour and the day will take care of itself. And if somebody repeats that over and over and over again, again, it helps they then break that huge thing, which might be this long day with a lot of different training sessions to something more manageable. Um, this is especially helpful. I do this a lot of time if a client seems distracted because they have something else going on in their life. Maybe it's work situation, maybe it's school, whatever it is that they are feeling anxious about or something um, in the future and I'll shift them into trying to use that internal narrative. And again, it's a form of segmenting and self-talk. So the next thing I want to talk about is compartmentalization. And that is the ability to recognize thoughts and feelings and set them aside in the moment to do what must be done. Um, and this is really effective. As I talked about in the stress response, there's two forms of anxiety that really have a huge cost to them when they're not actually in preparation for something physically difficult. And that's just normal anxiety where you're thinking about something in the future that you feel is challenging for you and rumination and that's thinking about something in the past. Um, and as we talked about the discussion on stress, thoughts make feelings and what happens in your brain happens in your bloodstream. So if you're fixating on things that you perceive to be difficult for you, you're going to have these stress responses and that's going to have a huge impact and reduce your resilience over time. Um, so the important thing to remember is you can't directly change feelings, but you can change the thoughts that drive them. So recognizing when you're fixating on something that happened in the past or something that you feel is going to happen in the future that is challenging and being able to shift that, your internal narrative and the thoughts and focus on what is in front of you, that is compartmentalization. Um, and again, this is really, really helpful. So as a coach, what I tend to do is pay attention to body language. As I talked about, this is a lot, a lot of getting people to do these things is identifying when people are getting out of that sweet spot where they're focused on the thing in front of them and they're feeling confident. So body language tends to be the giveaway to me. Um, sometimes it can be the tone of their voice. 
but some good ways to bring this up and to figure out if somebody is stuck thinking about something in the past or something that's going to happen to them in the future is again asking them what are you telling yourself and how can you shift your focus to the present um, or what do you need to do to shift your attention to get the most out of the current moment um, and again as i talked about when i talked about mindfulness this is where pr practicing meditation is really helpful um, just in the sense that people become more skillful at uh, paying attention to their own internal dialogue and noticing when their mind is wandering and getting into feedback loops that aren't helpful for them. So as I said, compartmentalization, very effective skill. And the best way to utilize this is by paying attention to people's body language, asking open-ended questions, and then having them solve their own problems and direct their attention instead of just telling people what to do. And the last one that I want to talk about is visualization. So visualization is designed to increase your sense of predictability and control by mentally rehearsing an upcoming challenging situation. And the way you want to use visualization is back and forth between visualization and action. And visualization is really just an effective way of harnessing the anxiety response because it helps you dial in the stress response that is going to come up. It helps you build a mental model and therefore have this high sense of predictability and control over what's going to happen and a measure of familiarity in the scenarios that you're visualizing in that moment. I mean, an important thing to note here, the more realistic it is, the more helpful it is. And so a lot of times people will feel really cheesy about this. So as a coach, it can be helpful. It's the reason why people love guided meditation because it's very difficult to fix or focus on your attention um, using just your own form of attention, but the, when you can guide someone through that thing and focus on the very specific strategies or coaching cues that they're going to use to execute the upcoming challenge effectively, then it becomes really, really, really helpful for them dialing in the stress response. And then they do the event and then you can use visualization again. So say they made a small mistake in the execution of an event. They can visualize themselves making the correction and doing it perfectly the next time before they actually do that event. And it's a mental and physical primer for doing that thing well. And it's really just a form of learning. So that brings me to the last concept that I wanna talk about, which is SIT or stress inoculation training. Um, and what this really means is it's the deliberate practice of recognizing and managing the stress response during the execution of a skill. As I talked about, that's most of what we are doing during this entire that's the primary factor in driving resilience and the underlying skills are using a lot of those mental skills I talked about and some of the psychological qualities that I mentioned um, as a driver to help you do this effectively. But as a coach, this is your job. It's to use this stress and inoculation training model to where you are managing someone's overall stress, understanding that stress is progressive and cumulative, that cycles to enhance learning are essential and that your job is to not automate skills too soon. And here, a good example of this would be teaching somebody how to do a squat. And we've all seen this gone awry where somebody does, you know, moves to a back squat far too soon and their technique is terrible. And the only way to correct that entire feedback loop is to go back to the beginning and start off with, you know, a bodyweight squat, squat or a goblet squat or something more simple to where they can manage the overall amount of stress. They can do that thing really well and you progressively add intensity, duration, and complexity to the movement over time. And then by the time you are adding load on a barbell back squat, they've dialed it in. And so the thing to remember here is you mostly learn through success, not nearly as much through failure. Now failure and setbacks are inevitable. However, you generally want people to be successful. The only thing you learn when you fail is what didn't work. When you are successful, you learn what is working. And so you wanna build upon success. And as a coach, you have that mental model of the things that people need to do and need to do well. So it's your job to manage the overall amount of stress to where your clients are right at the edge of their ability, where they're generally being successful, and then you slowly add those small layers of difficulty or stress via intensity, duration, and complexity. So, that's my presentation on resilience. As Joel mentioned, we just released our book uh, called Building the Elite. And as Joel said, it's based on preparing people for special operations selection programs. But the reality is, is the 
overwhelming amount of principles that we talked about really do apply to anybody who wants to be a more resilient and capable person. Um, and right now, if you use the code 25 off, you'll get 25% off and that works until the end of the week. Um, and I'll throw the link in here in a second. And last, I'll throw up my contact info. So you can follow us on Instagram at building the elite, or you can email me at any time. If you have any questions on this or anything else, me and my co-founder Craig Weller are happy to answer you guys' questions. Hey, Craig, you want, you want to talk about uh, real quick, just the difference in coaching, you know, say one-on-one -on -one versus small group versus large group and kind of how you, how do you manage developing these skills and working with people on this sort of mindset um, and just developing these different principles or developing these different skills in, in different types of coaching scenarios? Cause obviously it's more difficult with a large group or a team versus a one-on-one -on -one or, you know, three-on-one -on -one type scenario. Yeah. I mean, one-on-one -on -one is helpful in the sense that people tend to be more open to those open-ended questions. So what I do when I'm coaching, um, a larger group of people at my gym is I tend to have these conversations one-on-one. -on -one. I'll pay attention to people's body language, how a workout's going or not going. And then that's when I'll have an individual conversation with them um, where they can feel comfortable. And again, this is where you need to be curious and um, non-judgmental in your questions. It's not about, Hey, you know, like you're not performing well, what's going on. It's, Hey, I noticed looks like things are off a little bit. Can you tell me a little bit more about how you're feeling or what you're telling yourself? Um, in, in general, in groups, I tend to direct people and give them, as I said, a mental model of what we're doing that day. And specifically, I'll kind of guide them on what to focus on. And that's your job as a coach. So it might be, hey, this is going to be, this is going to push you. We're doing a conditioning workout and I want you to work on segmenting. So I want you to think of whatever small amount of duration you can wrap your mind around and just make it to that time and then go and then to the next point, the next point, the next point. So I'll use more of the general cues for the group to help coach them and direct them. And a lot of times I'll, I'll do other things to help break up the accumulation of stress response. So I'll use things like breathing drills in between difficult bouts of things because it has this huge parasympathetic response and I'll guide them through that breathing drill where I'll guide the breathing in through the nose, out through the mouth with a pause and then repeat. And again, that allows people to be more effective because I'm, I'm kind of reinforcing the mental model and not counting on them just doing it properly. Yeah, that makes sense. And then you, you when you first start working with a new client, is there any sort of mental, um, I guess, profiling or assessment? Is there anything formal? Is it more just talking and learning uh, people react to stress? I mean, do you sort of evaluate that kind of as part of the onboarding with your clients or whoever you're working with or the, you know, the uh, spec ops? I mean, how do you look at the, kind of baseline understanding where someone's mindset is to start with? Yeah, that's a great question. So it depends on who we're working with. So with our special operations guys, part of the reason we've been so successful with them is our screening process. So for a long time, we didn't have a very big presence. Um, we kind of stayed on the outskirts of things and we were intentionally just trying to develop our model. Um, so people had to find us. Then they had to pay more than they would pay elsewhere for training. They had to fill out a really long application. Um, we would intentionally wait multiple days to get back to them on either end of that application. Um, and the application was like 20 pages long. And the whole point of all this is that we were screening for a lot of things. Somebody's ability to uh, manage their impulse control, how conscientious they were, whether or not they were willing to see something through. And a lot of times what I looked for in that screening process was how long they had been sticking to training for something like how far along in the process were they, how much thought had they put into what they were already doing. And then we use that as a way of screening people. And so that's at one end of the spectrum. That's the spec ops guys. Obviously we don't do that for gym pop clients. So for them, the best way to assess people is always through their past behavior. So as you work with people, you just start to pay attention to how they respond to things, how they respond to challenges. Um, again, by asking those questions and paying attention to what people do over time, you get a really idea, good idea of who they are as a person, um, much better than if you ask them any kind of questions. Because people typically, they either want to think they're a certain type of person or they simply are unaware of what's going on. So asking be a question and, and they're very suggestive. So people's memory, even if, that they're trying to be truthful. Most people are really terrible at self-assessing. So we typically look at behavior and that's 
past behavior is the best indicator of future behavior. That makes sense. And one, one other question for everyone open up questions. Um, we kind of didn't talk about the fact that you work for Precision Nutrition and oversee you know, the men's coaching with thousands of people essentially. And now with a lot of coaches working virtually and coaching people online, um, you know, do you have some recommendations of how you can coach some of these things when you're not actually in front of somebody? Yeah, no, that, that's a really good question. So online co um, coaching is definitely in just different than in-person coaching. And I would say the most important thing is developing rapport with people initially, and then being curious, asking open-ended questions, and most importantly, um, kind of coming alongside someone. So a lot of times when people talk about their challenges, as a coach, the first thing that we want to do is give them a solution. And that's not really helpful for most people. For most people, they want to know that you understand first by developing, that's that process of developing some rapport. Um, so again, you have to ask opening questions, be really inquisitive, and then when they give you that response, don't immediately provide the solution. Um, you just have to be inquisitive about them, tell them that you understand, um, build that sense of trust, and then from there, you can give them direction. You can say, hey, have you tried this? Have you ever tried thought about this? Um, again, it doesn't mean you can't provide them with possible solutions over time, but most people are far, they're, they're they learn much faster and they you tend to be much more seen as much more effective as a coach if they come up with their own solutions. They're much more invested in that process. So would you say it's just a different coaching mentality than we see? I would, I would argue then today where really it's just, Hey, do this, do this, do this, do that. Why don't you go, go eat this food, go eat that food versus. Yeah. I mean, most people about. know a lot of the things they need to be doing, especially in the nutrition front, but even with exercise. So it's figuring out it's working with them to help them solve their own problems and become more consistent over time. So yeah, it's a general approach. And with, you know, online communication, you got to figure out the best way, the way your client communicates most effectively. Some people love the written word, like Craig, uh, who I work with, who, you know, we, who co-wrote the book with me, like he loves written communication. Like he'll write me like a, a eight page email. Um, and that's his preferred method of communication. Whereas some people really dislike that. Some people are not going to communicate very effectively via the written word. So maybe that's why at PN we do coaching calls like this, where I can get face to face with somebody and see their body language. I can ask them questions. That's how they prefer to communicate. Some people are going to like written communication. Some people are going to want to meet in person periodically. It kind of depends on the person, but you have to have that, uh, quite a mix of options for your clients if you really want to be successful again and you need to ask a lot of open-ended questions and try to understand the people that you're working with more than just telling them the solutions to their problems yeah i mean i agree so let's uh go ahead and open up if you got some questions here you can just kind of open up a little questions box and fire away Yes, yeah, so I got a question about becoming more mentally tough. So mental toughness is an interesting um, phenomenon. I mean, in, in pop culture, that's the thing that we think about when we think about somebody in the military or special operations, that they're super mentally tough. But there's actually really no agreed upon definition of what that actually means in research and not a lot of good research. And what it really means is resilience, what I just covered in the collection of psychological abilities that we cover in our book in depth. Um, mental toughness, if anything, just correlates with goal fixedness or this idea of I set a goal and then I stick to that thing until I accomplish it. Um, but in general, resilience is the path to create that um, mental toughness over time or what most people consider mental toughness. How much do you think, how much have you guys seen in terms of just people's genetic predispositions or their environmental when they were youth growing up? I mean, how much of that sort of thing do you think plays a role in terms of by the time you get to an adult, you know, they're less malleable than, you know, somebody who grew up in a different situation maybe. Yeah. Um, I mean the things that play the biggest role. So there's the big five personality traits and, and those are the more fixed personality traits. Um, and the one in there that seems to play the biggest role in this is conscientiousness. Um, and that's just the tendency to be very organized, to see things through, to be very committed to the work that you're doing. Um, and that's a little bit more fixed than all the rest of the qualities I just talked about, which are all trainable. 
And I do see that people's backgrounds or the way their parents interacted with them probably influences their tendency to be maybe more of a fixed or a growth mindset or have this sense of hardiness, which is another concept that we talk a lot about in the book. However, as I said, there's a lot of research and from our experience too, these things are very trainable. And so if the person cares and is looking to uh, become more capable over time, the biggest thing is creating a space where they're adaptable. And so that's managing their overall stress load, whether that's via their recovery strategies, um, you know, everything going on in their life. So their, their total allostatic load can't be too high because if that is too high, that just kills learning. Um, so even somebody who's really well-intentioned until that gets managed, you're not going to see a lot of progress, but if they can manage that effectively, then people can change quite a bit. Yeah. I think one of the things we've seen in the industry is the, the high intensity, we're going to crush you every workout mindset is just killed this concept. A lot of people, because ultimately they feel like failures or they're not going to kill every workout. They're going to let the workout kill them more often than not. And that's just setting them up for this feeling of, I, don't, I can't do this. I don't want to do this. I'm going to quit this. You know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're not building off of success. If every time somebody comes in, they feel like they're failing and they're getting beat by everybody else, it's and and then you're teaching them that they're only the sensation of feeling crushed and being defeated by a workout is a successful workout. You're setting them up for this lifetime of of like not wanting to work out because they're avoiding that feeling because it's natural. No one wants to feel that way, but at the same time, feeling like that's what they should be doing because that's what people who are tough are doing. And that's not true. People who are really capable, most days actually feel easy. The goal is to make hard things easy, not to make easy things hard. Yeah, it's, 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 you know, it's funny. I've got a friend who makes video games. In the video game world, massive research goes into this because if you have a player that, that joins a video game and gets online play and match with groups, and every time they play the game, they get beat to shit, they quit playing the game. So they spend you know massive amounts of man hours and resources and time and money making sure their matching system and the gameplay is meant to keep somebody winning and playing at a competitive level without getting killed all the time because that's the fastest way to lose somebody playing a game but then you walk into a gym and it becomes this big contest of how much can we smash our clients into the ground and then we wonder why they leave yeah yeah so i mean manual here had a question about like with usual timeline how often do you work on resilience? I mean, every day is worked on resilience. So as I mentioned in that presentation, it's all about managing stress effectively. If we manage that systemic stress and we can orient someone to focusing on some of those mental skills that we're talking about and we're giving them feedback on a daily basis, it, it never ends. Um, and how long does it take to see lasting changes? It totally depends on the individual. It can be really quickly um, depending on how plastic they are. And as I said, that has more to do with their overall stress levels. And you know, what we find, what I've found, is that there's a sweet spot where people who are younger tend to be really plastic, and then people who actually are retired tend to be, can be very plastic um, because they've reduced most of their allostatic load. A lot of the people who are retired, their kids are out of the house, they no longer have a, a stressful job, they usually have financial security, um, and they're pursuing something and they're, they're looking to improve their cognitive and physical capability. And a lot of times those people, even though they're older, they'll change pretty quickly um, because they have that ability to manage their overall stress load. So that really is the biggest variable. Um, Mike asked a question here for SFAS if we have performance standards. Yeah, we definitely do when we outline them in the book. Um, but most important, and I talked about this a little bit, it's the cumulative load. So it's not just what you're doing, it's how you're doing those things. So you know, we want somebody who's fairly strong, who has this large aerobic base, um, who moves fairly well, but it's also how, how are they able to do those things? In other words, when they're performing um, those lifts and when they're hitting certain strength standards, it's how do they move when they do those things? You know, how, when they're doing the ruck standards that we're asking them to do, how are they managing their stress response and making their way through that thing? A lot of times that's as important as the physical output. And we talk about this a lot in the book where, um, you know, Craig refers to them as, I think, thoroughbreds, but you have these people who go to selection all the time and they're physical specimens. I mean, they are just, you know, they're water polo or former triathletes in college D1 guys, and then they go into a selection program. And physically, 
they have everything you could want them to have, but their limiting factor might be psychological. So there's no physical limiting factor for the reason why they can't make selection, it's psychological. And some people um, might have all the psychological traits in the world, but they're, they don't move particularly well, or their endurance isn't where it's supposed to be, because all these things play together. So if I have a physical limiting factor, that's gonna play with my psychology. If I have a psychology, psychological limiting factor, that's gonna affect my physiology. You can't tease the two out. And so again, we talk about that in depth, and I know it doesn't necessarily answer your question perfectly, but I hopefully it gives you an idea of there's a little bit more complexity there than simply, can I do this, this, and this? And that's why, I mean, all these guys who go to selection programs, they have a contract. So they've hit the minimums. They've hit the standards that the military um, is asking you to have in order to go to this selection, to go to the selection process. And yet a majority of them still fail. And so why is that true? Again, it's because there's a lot more nuance to it than just hitting certain physical standards. Um, pharmacological approach. I mean, we don't, I, obviously there's, uh, in some of the selection programs, guys are on uh, different drugs, but for the most part, it doesn't seem to really help. Um, Craig can talk to this a little bit more, uh, but none of our clients, that we know of have ever taken anything. Um, yeah, and it doesn't really play a big role. Again, managing stress, managing nutrition, and all the rest of the things tend to play a much, much bigger role. So then Rail asks a question. What do you do when your players are mad, paralyzed from imaginary fear before a match? Ah, uh, yeah, so this is really good. So this is, um, this would be an opportunity to use visualization um, and try to replicate, manage their stress response really effectively in the practice situation. So like if you think of like a really high level performer, they're not trying to replicate the game experience in practice. They're trying to replicate the practice experience in a game. And they're doing that by managing their overarching stress response. And so it would be using all of those strategies that we talked about first. And a lot of times there's probably going to be some deep seated beliefs that they have there about their ability to perform. They're probably telling themselves that if they don't perform well, that says something about who they are as a person. Um, and that, that can be that underlying driver of their fear. Um, so getting to know the person and figuring out what probably is the driver, like what that anxiety is driven from, what the belief is, and then replacing that belief with something more productive, is going to be the best way to help that person overcome that thing. And then what you would want to do, you know, if you have matches, you obviously have preseason games, you have probably lower intensity matches, you would want to try to help execute, slowly integrate them into those matches where they're managing their anxiety and their stress response more effectively and build on success over time. It's going to be hard to go from you know, practice where there's very little anxiety or very little stress to say an important match. Yeah, hey, uh, someone asked in the chat panel here, I don't know if you saw that one, uh, John, but just how do you deal with some clients that think that failing and in, in hard work in the workout is part of the process of being successful instead of thinking that success this session is really the, uh, success each session is the way to long-term success. How do you change the mindset that just smashing themselves into the ground is probably actually not the right path to success, even though a lot of the industry and people around them are basically telling them that and they've come to believe that. Yeah. I mean, I would just ask questions as to why they believe that and, and, and what proof they have that that is working for them. Ask them like, how's that working for you? That's always the best question. So um, I deal with this a lot with nutrition where people will tell me that they're very committed to a specific thing. Like, Oh, I'm going to do paleo and I really want to do paleo or keto or whatever it is. Um, throw a name out there. And I'm like, okay, great. Well, um, if you want to keep doing that, it's perfect, but can you just tell me how that's working for you? And a lot of times it's like, um, well, it's not really working for you. Okay. Well, you know, if it's not working for you, do you feel like you want to keep doing that same thing? And again, as long as you keep it open and inquisitive, then it can be very effective and they can start to kind of unravel because <laughs> they, they, they obviously have a belief around, why that thing is. And so you can also ask open questions of like, well, why do you believe that? Can you tell me more about that? And a lot of times you'll get to the underlying belief or thought that's there. Um, but again, you have to open that with this, you have to start it with this open 
kind of inquisitive nature. Whereas if you attack the person and say, no, you're wrong. You need to think like this and this is why it's never going to work. You have to figure out what's the emotional thing they care about. So obviously they're looking to improve or else they wouldn't be at that gym, right? They're, they're showing up and they're training hard, which tells you a lot about that person. Um, so they obviously have some kind of belief tied to that approach. And as soon as you can figure out what that belief is, and question it and get them to think about it a little bit more, then you'll have an opportunity. Makes sense. All right. So if I ever go for a workout, it seems like I'm going for a championship and it really destroys the session. What would be a cue? Yeah. I mean, that's where you want to reduce the difficulty to the point where you're successful. And then, so it, in other words, if you're visualizing that this is a really important workout and I have to do really well on this thing, you're building it up to be really, really important. And then you're amp and probably reducing uh, your sense of predictability and control over what's going to happen, or you're reducing, you know, you're, you're just, you're, you're making it a very stressful event. And then as we talked about, you're not really building up t on top of success. So like what we do with all our guys is we start easier than we think it should be. And then we really, really, really slowly layer in stress over time so that they're almost always successful. And the goal is, is that we just expand that range of what they're comfortable with. Um, we don't go from easy to hard and I don't want to push them too far. I want to push them right to the edge of their ability, but again, build off of success. And it sounds like you're kind of going from, normal training to this i'm envisioning that it's a championship and i'm going really hard again that messes up the session so instead i would back off and instead the internal narrative would be i'm going to try to make this as easy as i can or i'm trying to make this as as smooth as possible so evan talked about the applicability of firefighting yeah i actually work we have multiple firefighters at the gym um, and we use all these same things anyone who works in a occupation where it's a high stress occupation where you have to have this whole large variability of qualities. Like you're not an, a specialist. You're really the ultimate generalist and you need to have this huge work capacity. Your job is to be a resilient person who can learn quickly on the fly and be pretty good at everything, which is the definition of firefighting. Obviously there's some more specific capabilities for each one of these fields, just like there is for every special operations um, group. And that's what the military takes care of. Um, we just try to give them and maintain the specific qualities that's going to allow them to, once they get into that situation, then the military takes over, that they can learn and adapt really quickly and, and become the people that the training is meant to develop them to be. So Jerry asked, I see this is an important tool to use with youth. Oh, for sure, definitely. And, and um, I would say, you know, if you read the book in depth, there's a lot of things in there that talk about how your environment and the framework and how we're, you think about just developing and, and pushing people. Um, so, so I think the book would be a really helpful tool. Obviously, it doesn't speak specifically to education and youth, but the general framework that we talked about is giving you principles that will guide the things that you're doing. It's not just a, a collection of methods. So it's a way of thinking about a complex problem. And if you use those principles in whatever situation you're in, you're going to be successful. Marie said, do you have recovery strategy to recover from? Yeah, that's, that's definitely a difficult one. And we, we find this with um, guys who were previously operational and, and Craig can actually speak to this. I'll see if he's here because he might actually be he had to um, deal with this himself that you, uh, Craig's here. Joel, can you make him a panelist so he can answer this question? Because he'll get a really good only, response. Only you can now because you're the host. Uh, I'm going to figure this out. Did you click on his name and then gives you the option? All right. There he is. Go ahead, Craig. What's the question? So do you have a recovery strategy to recover Riverboy from? Riverboy Craig. <laughs> <laughs> do you have a recovery strategy to recover from months or years of high stress and cortisol to get back to normal once the stressor is gone? 
Uh, yeah, one of the main things is to tightly regulate your sleep. Um, because especially a lot of soft guys, like when I first got out, I'd done three back-to-back or four back-to-back deployments back and forth all over the world and then done a couple trips to like New Zealand. So I'd been in every possible time zone constantly. And then most of the time I was working was at night or for multiple days. So my sleep cycle was destroyed. And one of the most important things was to just get back to a normal cycle and start to impose a structure on how I slept and how I woke up. Um, so I started getting up at roughly 6 a.m. every day, regardless of what time I went to bed, regardless of whether I slept well or not. And then as soon as I could, I got out and got as much sun exposure as I could. Um, I did some of that actually while I was working in Iraq. So I'd go out and like suntan in the morning on top of a cement box um, because early morning sun exposure helps to augment the cortisol awakening response and sort of uh, kickstart the cyclical variability that you want in, in your hormonal system and your nervous system through the day. Um, and then once sleep is controlled, pay attention to your use of stimulants. If you have any dependency on coffee, caffeine in general, if you need like bro explode to work out any stuff like that, where you're relying on an external crutch to give yourself a functioning nervous system, um, you'll have to find a way to wean yourself off of that. And then look at the variability in your movement system. So the way, kind of like what we, we talk about in the book and what John mentioned a little bit here in this course, we want to look at movement variability, that you're not just stuck as a sagittal plane extension monster, that you're not only doing straightforward up and down things like squats and deadlifts, and that you can actually exhale and move in three planes of motion and and get parasympathetic, like give your body the ability to to modulate your nervous system. And then on top of that, uh, look at your nutrition. And, and nutrition, people love to make it really complicated, but regardless of whether you're an Olympian or just a beginner office worker or whatever, uh, most nutrition comes down to eating more vegetables and, and doing the things that you already know are good for you. Um, but if you dial in your nutrition, get appropriate amounts of of fresh fruits and vegetables, you get plenty of uh, good fatty acids, fish oil, things like that. Um, That can help over time as well. And there are a few nutraceutical things you can use that help to modulate your cortisol response, like ashwagandha, um, some variants of ginseng are useful. Um, Magnesium threonate crosses the blood brain barrier and helps you sleep. There's a few things like that you can use, but you're basically just trying to restore a cycle where you wake up and focus and are really active and engaged in the morning. And then you can actually deeply shut down at night. And once you do those things, your body will start to recover and repair itself and you'll come back to normal. But it's depending on how long you've been digging yourself in a hole, it can be a pretty long-term process. Yeah. And just to add to that, um, and this actually answers Brian's question too. It's just like learning to regulate the stress response throughout the day. So going through those cycles throughout the day is really helpful too. Most people um, wake up high cortisol and then they get to work and they just don't stop until they crash and they tend to use stimulants to midway through the day to just keep working and then they go to the gym and take bro bro explode 5,000 and then try to crush themselves and they're just ramping up cortisol and not going through these natural ups and downs throughout the day. So even taking like little baby breaks throughout the day and we talk about structure being a big part of the day. Um, so that you have the ability to tune in and pay attention to the signals that your brain is giving you. And, you know, as Craig talked about there, and I didn't talk about this in depth, but we use breathing as in in different movement drills as a way to regulate overall um, sympathetic and parasympathetic tone because your state of inhalation versus exhalation and overall physical tone is greatly Um, correlated with your overall stress response throughout the day as well. So going through these cycles up and down throughout the day, we build in structural small breaks where maybe it's meditating for a few minutes or just doing a breathing, uh, different breathing resets or going for a short nap or whatever it may be. And then you have these highs and lows throughout the day and it helps stop this massive accumulation of these huge swings um, in the stress response. And so Brian talked about how you could apply these techniques to business or sales. Like context is really Um, I talked about it in here in the sense of um, training being your stressor, but regardless of your situation, I use these same 
techniques, like public speaking is, is not my forte, um, neither is it Craig's. Uh, so these, I use these same strategies to prepare for this presentation and to help manage my stress response and to practice what I was going to be doing beforehand. So regardless of what you're really preparing for, um, all of the qualities that we talk about in the book are going to help regardless of the specific context. And you can apply them in those different contexts by using the general principles. And again, we talk in the book a lot about principles and less about use this exact method at this exact time. It's not a formula, it's a different way of thinking. And one, one thing I'll mention real quick too, just uh, we didn't go there at all, but just things like HRV um, and tools like Morpheus that we you know, have developed, it, it's really valuable for people because again, if you have this idea that I'm gonna go to the gym and crush myself every day and I'm gonna go through this process and that's the way to lead to success, you know, it's really hard to argue with the data showing you going the wrong direction and seeing yourself with a low recovery score and your HRV tanking when you try this. So, uh, you know, look, it's, it's a really objective way to show people essentially the impact of the stress they put on their bodies and the impact of not sleeping and the impact of like I said, bro explode and every other caffeinated drink in the world all day long. They can actually see some objective data so where they can see like, Oh, wait a minute, maybe this isn't going the right direction for me. So, uh, you know, especially nowadays people have these wearables. It's just a question of getting them to, use them in a more effective manner and you know not to just throw morpheus out there but i think it's the best tool for that but regardless whatever people are using i mean people are collecting data it's it's uh, you know a valuable tool as a coach to say look you know how's your sleep been well let's look at the data let's see what it's actually looking like or you know how active you've been well it looks like you're you know you're, you're just not moving throughout the day because you're probably sitting for the computer how about taking a five minute break every hour and going for a little walk and doing these things to you know to break that stress cycle like he's talking about you can use technology and you can use these tools that are out there now to help people uh, you know, make these better strategic decisions about how they are managing stress because we can actually start to measure the effects of that through HRV and other uh, technologies out there. Yeah, and, and I'll just wrap up with his last couple of questions. Dan talks about tips for panic attacks and general anxiety. So all the things we talked about today are going to be very helpful for those exact things. You know, mindfulness, meditation, and uh, look into cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT um, and some of the concepts that we talk about in this book will look very similar to that because it's the same process of attuning to and starting to learn about your mind and then having a process of basically reprogramming or relearning the way you think about difficulty and challenge and your emotions and your thoughts. There's a good podcast by a guy named David Burns, who's a CBT therapist that um, could walk you through a lot of that stuff. And it is surprisingly similar to in, in principle to the stuff we teach special ops guys in regulating their stress responses like like john said earlier the basic premise is thoughts make feelings you can't just directly control your feelings but you can control the thoughts that drive them yeah and i'll answer the last question real here it says like what to say to his player in a tension situation at the end of a game um and again, I think if you could focus that player onto the thing that they can control and segment and get them to focus on, again, those, those small little things that are going to give them a high sense of control and manage their uh, focus on, because a lot of times what they'll do is they'll focus on the fact that it's the end of the game or that there's a lot of pressure, and that'll be their internal dialogue. So if you can focus them more on the things that they can control and what they're going to be doing. And a lot of times that's just coaching. It's giving people specific directions of where to go and what to do. And if they focus on that, they'll forget about the fact that it's the end of the game. All right, so we're all good. Thanks uh, everybody. Want to give them a real quick, this final thing of how to, I know you had it up there for a little while, but if people stick around, how to find you, how to get the book, all that sort of stuff, and we can uh, sign off. Yeah, so I'll throw the link in here uh, for the book. Um, yeah, I'll also send out an email for everybody too. Right. Well, Joel will send out an email to everyone. So you can find us on Instagram at Building the Elite. And we share a ton of helpful tips in there too, even including stuff that's not in the book. Um, you can, I would sign up for our newsletter on buildingtheelite.com because we'll be sharing more information in the future. And that's also where you can find a link to our book. And if you use the coupon code 25 off, you get 25% off. So at the end of the week. The books, you want to tell me how much the book is? I mean, the book's incredibly cheap for what it is. Yeah, the book's 55 bucks. So you'll get it for what, 48 bucks. And like I said, it's 400 pages. It's, it took us six years to write. It was 
there's an incredible amount of information in there. Yeah, it, it really is the the Bible of of building the elite, as you said. It's it's a great book, so I definitely recommend it uh, to everybody. And like I said, I'll send out an email that has a recording of this, along with the links, discount code, all that kind of stuff. So thanks again for me and John. If you have anything to wrap up with, we'll uh, sign off. No, I just appreciate everybody attending and taking an hour out of your day to hopefully get some valuable skills. All right, great. Thanks, guys. Talk to you guys later.